Today's video will cover body defenses, including the integumentary system, the immune system, and the lymphatic system. So we're going to start first with the integumentary system. The okay, integumentary system is our skin. So we're going to look at some different components of the skin and its derivatives. Okay, so integumentary system includes the skin. That would be the main portion of the integumentary system. It also includes the other derivatives of skin, like um, hair and nails, fingernails, and in other organisms, things like feathers and scales would all be considered derivatives of the skin as well. So the human skin is divided into a couple of layers. Okay? We've got our epidermis here, which is this top layer here, and then the dermis, which is this larger layer underneath. Okay? Um, embedded in that dermis is a number of structures that can help us. Uh, for instance, we have the sweat glands, which are these kind of swirly looking glands here. Okay? So those are your sweat glands. They're going to produce the sweat to help you keep cool when you get too warm. Uh, we also have these sebaceous or oil glands. Okay, there's sebaceous for you there. So these sebaceous or oil glands, they're going to secrete the oil. They're usually associated with a hair follicle. Okay, and you know that hair, again, is one of the derivatives of skin, so it's part of the system. Uh, in addition to the sweat glands and the oil glands, we also have receptors for sensation. Okay, these are some of our receptors for sensation here. We've got a Meisner's corpuscle up here that's going to help with light touch, pressure, okay, these Pacinian corpuscles, these larger ones here, those deal with deep touch, vibration. You're also going to have um, these free nerve endings. Okay, so free nerve endings, all these little, uh, these little yellow things in here up underneath the epidermis. Those free nerve endings will be important for pain reception, temperature reception. Okay, so we've got a lot of connections here with the uh, nervous system in monitoring all the different sensations that our skin is able to um, able to give us information regarding. Again, things like temperature, pain, pressure, vibration. Okay, uh, we also have a number of blood vessels located uh, in the lower layers of the skin. You see down here, and we've got a number of arteries and veins down in those lower le levels. Those will be important in just a minute. We talk about temperature control. Okay, and then as well as the hair shafts that are embedded in the skin as, again, one of the derivatives. So the skin has a wide variety of functions. Okay, it definitely provides a barrier. That would be one of the ways it can interact with the immune system. Okay, it provides a barrier for microorganisms, help prevent them from coming into the body. Also, the oil glands, they secrete um, in the oil. There's, a little, there's some microbial, antimicrobial properties that help um, also kind of reinforce that barrier. Okay, the skin helps prevent what's called desiccation. Okay, desiccation would be this drying out here, okay, your dehydration. One of the big concerns with burn patients when they lose that, those outer layers of skin is that they're constantly losing fluid. Okay, so this, the skin prevents desiccation or us drying out. The skin, when it interacts with the sun, okay, will produce vitamin D. Okay, so there we have, we produce inactive forms of vitamin D in our body, and then with the sun exposure, the UV light from the sun exposure, it will turn it into active vitamin D. The skin, like we mentioned on the last slide, also is involved in sensation. Things, again, like pain, temperature, pressure, um, all those things involved with touch. So there's, again, like I said, a nervous system interaction there. So I've got an immune interaction with the barrier keeping the bacteria out, a nervous system interaction with the, um, all the information about sensation. And the skin also is important for body temperature control, which is another nervous system interaction. Okay, the hypothalamus of your body is going to, y'all remember that from your diagram, your hypothalamus associated with your pituitary gland. Your hypothalamus monitors your body temperature levels. So that's part of the nervous system. And then the skin will help respond to that, help elicit the response from the nervous system um, based upon whether your temperature is too high or too low. So let's take a look at what your body does to help regulate that. So we were talking about how the skin helps maintain body temperature. So let's look a little closer at that. So when the hypothalamus in the brain reads the body temperature, it will do, send some signals to the skin for the skin to make a difference with, uh, with help change the body temperature. And so one of the most common ways we think of is with sweat, right? If our body temperature is too low, then we start producing sweat. Remember, sweat is, made of, sweat is mostly made of water. 
Okay? And water, as it evaporates, will remove the heat from the body because water is very good at retaining heat. And so as that water evaporates into the air, it takes the heat with it. So that's one of the ways that, that our skin can help lower body temperature. Another way it can help lower body temperature is through what's called vasodilation. Okay? When we dilate things, that means they get bigger. Okay? Usually we're talking about something being round, and so it would start here. And then when we dilate it, it gets larger. Okay, like your pupils dilate, they go, you know, your pupils change size, the black spot in your eye. And when you're exposed to very little light, they'll dilate, they'll get bigger. Okay, and so vaso, okay, vaso is our vessels. So in vasodilation, all of those blood vessels that were in the skin, they will dilate, they will get bigger. And you've probably seen this happen in people that are very fair skinned. When it's very hot outside, um, the blood vessels in the skin will dilate so more blood is coming to the surface and so they start to look pink or red. Okay, that vasodilation is important because the blood carries heat. Okay, since blood is mostly water and water retains heat, and so the blood carries heat. And so as the blood comes up towards the surface of the skin, it can radiate some of that heat out. You've probably noticed it um, if any of you guys are in any form of athletics or anything. You know, you don't like to, like after the game, you don't want to sit next to anybody in the bus because it makes you hotter because they're busy, their skin is vasodilated. And so they're busy releasing and radiating all of that heat. So if our body temperature is too cold, obviously we're not sweating. Okay, so obviously our sweat glands are closed and we're not sweating. Okay, but our body will also, our skin, because remember we're focused on the integumentary system here, our skin will also vasoconstrict. Okay, and so when we constrict something, we make it smaller. Okay, if you ever shined a light in somebody's eyes, you know, there's the pupil, and then it gets a lot smaller. Okay, when you shine the light in it, constricted. So in this case now, our vessels, the vaso, are constricting. So that pulls the blood that keep, remember blood carries the heat because heat is retained in water and blood is a lot of water. So that blood goes away from the surface of the skin and gets um, shuttled back in towards your heart, your lungs, more your internal organs, things that are vital. You know, you can have frostbite and lose a finger and you're not going to die. Okay? But if your internal organs get frozen, then you would, you would die. So with vasoconstriction, our body will try to bring, that's why in real cold weather, people, uh, again, fair-skinned people, they start to look paler because their blood is being um, pulled away from the surface of the skin so as not to release any of that heat. Okay, so we got a variety of functions for our skin. Okay, um, and like we said before, one of those was a barrier for our immune system. So let's take a look then at the actual immune system. So the main job of our immune system is to fight infections, fight off um, bacteria and viruses that have entered the body and okay, try to get rid of them, break them down, get, okay, remove them from your system. So the immune system is going to do that in a variety of ways. You don't need to memorize this chart or anything. Just kind of showing you that there's a lot of variety here. The immune system can take care of the infected cells, your own infected cells. It can try to uh, eat and destroy the bacteria and the viruses that are invading it can try to neutralize them. So there's a variety of things that it can do. So we're going to look at, um, we're going to briefly look at three different types of um, white blood cells. So you just get kind of an overview of all the different ways your immune system can help you. So the first one here is a, a neutrophil. A neutrophil is a type of phagocyte. If you all remember, phagocytosis was cell eating from your vocabulary. So in this instance, the neutrophil is going to be this big giant purple cell. Okay, and so Here's our bad guy. It's, uh, we'll call them pathogens a lot of times. You'll see that word. You do need to know that. A pathogen is basically anything that makes you sick. So it could be a virus. It could be a bacteria. It could be a fungus. Anything that's making you sick. It could be some kind of mold. A pathogen is anything that makes you sick. So here's our pathogen that's entered. This neutrophil is going to do phagocytosis. Remember, it's going to reach out. It's going to grab that pull it inside, okay. that vesicle will fuse with the lysosome. Remember, lysosomes do digestion. So that lysosome is going to, oh, that was terrible writing. So that lysosome is going to digest or break down that microbe. Okay. And then the broken down microbe will eventually be released from the cell by exocytosis. Remember, that was things being essentially being spit out of the cell. Okay, so neutrophils are just big cells that essentially run around eating the bad guys, eating the pathogens, and they break them down. 
Your next one is what's called a B cell. B cells make antibodies, okay? So they make antibodies. You know the difference between an antibody versus an antigen, okay? And so an antigen, there's your antigen there. These are your foreign particles, okay? So your antigen are your, they're your bad guys. They're your pathogens. Cannot write today. These antigens are the foreign particles, bacteria, viruses, whatever they are. Okay, so the antigen is the foreign particle, and the antibody is what our body makes to be able to ta help take care of that antibody, or take care of that antigen. So the antibodies, they're going to respond, and you can see here's, they're going to respond to that antigen. So uh, you don't need to know all the details of this. What you need to know is that here's my antigen. Here's my foreign invader. Okay, I've got a few of what are called B cells okay, that are floating around, and these B cells recognize that there is a foreign invader. So they start reproducing. They're cloning themselves. They're reproducing. And so these B cells start secreting lots of antibodies. Okay, and so antibodies are going to bind to the foreign particles. They're going to bind to the antigens. Okay, so the antibodies can do one of two things. Okay, they can either inactivate the pathogen or they can mark it for destruction. You know, they can signal other cells, other organs that this is a bad guy and they need to take care of it. So the antibodies... Again, so the antibodies are secreted by the B cell. So your body makes a B cell, and, the ant, and it secretes these antibodies. These antibodies respond to the foreign particle. They either mark it for destruction, or they signal other organs like your liver, your spleen, um, your lymph nodes to help take care of this. Okay? Or they can inactivate it themselves. Your B cells, when they're done fighting this antigen, some of them will stay behind. And you see down here, you've got some of them that stay behind that are called memory cells. And these memory cells are very important for our secondary immune response. We're going to look at that in just a second. But so when you have an infection that antibodies can take care of, these B cells, they'll increase in number a lot. Okay? So they'll increase in number to make all those antibodies. Once the infection is cleared up, they disappear and they leave behind just a couple of these memory cells. And we'll talk about, the, let's look at the importance of these memory cells. So those memory cells are very important in what's called our secondary immune response. Okay, so the very first time we're exposed to an antigen, if you look at your graph here, you're exposed to this antigen over here around day one. Okay, and you get the highest amount of antibodies to that antigen okay, almost two weeks later is when you get a large, you know, it takes a while for your body to, to figure out what it's been exposed to, to make the antibodies for it. Okay, and then the second time you're exposed to it, so now you're exposed to it already, but you'll notice your antibody level did not drop all the way to zero. You know, it was at zero down here. It did not drop all the way to zero because this is where you have some memory cells left over. So those cells remember. They can immediately recognize that antigen and tell the other cells to get moving on the antibodies. Nobody has to figure out what to do. Okay, so you notice your secondary immune response is much quicker. You notice it happened in a much shorter period of time. It's much faster and it's much stronger because the cells already know what to do because of these memory cells. They don't have to learn about the antigen because they already did. Okay, so in addition to the uh, neutrophils that can eat the foreign particles, the B cells that make the antibodies, we also have what are called T cells. And T cells attack your infected cells. So these are not directly attacking your, uh, these are not directly attacking the foreign particle. They're attacking your infected cell. So this beige cell right here, okay, that's your body's cell. And it's infected. Okay? It's full of these, micro it's full of the bacteria, full of the viruses. And your body is all about sacrificing one for the benefit of the many. Okay? So if it kills this one cell, then that cell can't go infect other cells. So your T cell, essentially, you think of your cell like a balloon, your T cell comes in and pops that balloon. And you notice it's letting in lots of water and ions. And remember, in hypotonic solutions, when we let lots of water go in, water goes in, 
Okay, and in an animal cell, it can cause lysis, right? So that T cell encourages water to go in, encourages it like it's in a hypotonic solution. Water to go in, the cell will swell up, and the cell can burst. Okay, um, HIV, so this is what you have over here on this side. Here's your HIV virus. HIV viruses attack what are called helper T cells. Okay, so HIV viruses, they attack helper T cells, and helper T cells do just that. They help out the T cells. Okay, so HIV, when it affects these helper T cells, it makes the people, it makes people that are infected more susceptible to other, um, other diseases because the helper T cells, they um, trigger antibody production, so they can trigger those B cells, and they also can activate T cells. So these helper T cells really get our immune function going. Okay? And so without the helper T cells, your immune response isn't very strong, which is part of that weakened immune system of people with um, HIV. Okay? Our lymphatic system, its main job is to remove fluid or lymph okay, from around the cells. Okay? So it removes this fluid, which is called lymph, Okay, which is a derivative of blood. Okay, the lymph came from the blood. It removes the lymph from around the cells and it filters it. So you can see down here, you've got your tissues. And so the fluid that is surrounding those capillaries, some of it will go into these lymph capillaries. Okay, so not all of the blood that came from the arteries here makes it all the way over to the veins. Some ends up in these lymph capillaries. And that lymph fluid will go through the lymph nodes Okay. It'll go through the lymph nodes, and it will get filtered. And as it gets filtered, it'll get returned back to the heart, back into the circulatory system. So it removes the lymph, and it filters it, and then it will return that back to the circulatory system. So it's working here with the circulatory system. So in addition to those lymph nodes, there's also going to be some other various organs that will have an impact in the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system... Okay, in addition to the lymph nodes that do the filtering, okay, so immune system action there, okay, we've got the spleen. Okay, well the spleen will filter blood. Okay, it'll help filter out old, worn out red blood cells, and it'll destroy those. Okay, you've got your tonsils. Most of you guys have heard of your tonsils. Those are lymphoid tissues in your throat that will help, track, um, that will help trap and remove bacteria. Okay, you also have the thymus. We talked briefly about the thymus before with endocrine glands. The thymus helps program lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are B cells and T cells. Okay, so the thymus helps program those lymphocytes. So it helps prepare them for um, when they come in contact with uh, foreign invaders, antigens. Okay, and then the Peyer's patches, okay, these are in the intestines. Okay, and these are very similar to your tonsils, but in your intestines. They also trap bacteria and foreign invaders in your intestines. Okay, so all of these things make up your lymph system, which will, again, just act as another filtering system. So kind of working with the immune system as well as working with the circulatory system since it filters the blood okay, to help clean it up and make sure that everything is um, germ-free. Okay, so these are your body's defenses, and we'll be working with these next class.